folks tell me, how can a known poison that exists in our food supply or medications, and sometimes even in the air you breathe, be totally overlooked as the cause of disease in America? Watch me now and soon you too will know the cause. I'll never forget one time a uh, nurse, and I reference this, I mentioned it, I didn't reference it uh, yesterday, a nurse who scrubbed for a, uh, a pulmonologist told me when they extubated, when they pulled uh, the, the uh, pipe up, you know, uh, from the patient, it always smelled like bread. It always smelled like bread, or sometimes smelled like bread. Folks, I think we harbor, no, I don't, and I know, Many of us harbor this yeast uh, in our lungs. And this doctor, I felt so bad for him, John, when I was reading this, uh, how knowledge helps the uncertainty. I'm a 70-year-old retired neurologist. I also have early onset Alzheimer's disease. In retrospect, my first symptom occurred about 15 years ago. I started to lose my sense of smell. Uh, I had no ability to detect odors. Then all of a sudden, I started having phantom scents, S-C-E-N-T-S. Early on, they consist, uh, they consist of smelling like bread, baking bread. And I'm thinking when, when this doctor extubated these endotracheal tubes or this bronchoscopy tube <clears throat> from these patients with lung diseases, and the nurse said it smelled like bread baking. She's talking about yeast. I, I don't know this guy's habits. He's 70 years old. We're going to talk about some of these things today. I wish... I could communicate with him, and my wife said, it's important that you do. And he may throw it away, but it's important that you do. I think today, I want to start backwards. I know there are many of you watching right now. Uh, this was a, a Science Daily I pulled out, <clears throat> excuse me, from 2017, the very year I had all these respiratory problems. Neurological diseases cost nearly $800 billion a year. That's five years ago, so by now it's a trillion. I didn't know what a trillion was in 2017. We needed, you know, this whole virus scenario to understand what a trillion was. Now I understand what, this is just neurological diseases. And folks, they run the gambit. I mean, I, I have, it's blown my mind how many neurological diseases I saw, not first, tertiary, secondary, or tertiary. Um, I, uh, these people would come to a dermatologist for uh, eczema. You know, I told you, granuloma annulari, uh, seborrheic dermatitis, uh, you know, psoriasis. <clears throat> but in talking with all those patients and the ear, nose, and throat patients back in California where I worked with Howard Gottschalk, I started getting it, folks. I started getting it when they said to me, I'm sleeping better. Could that have anything to do with these antifungals in your Kaufman diet? Mm, I don't think so. I'd like to take the credit. You know, that'd be great, but I don't think so. That's coincidental. I told you about the physician, chief of staff at one of the hospitals out here in Dallas, orthopedic wing, whose wife had horrible migraines, and they cleared up on my program. He followed her into Dr. Weekly's office, met Dr. Weekly. He had never met him. And he said, the reason I'm here is I'm chief of orthopedics at, and he mentioned the hospital, and we have tried for 30 years to get my wife's headaches gone, and for the past nine days, she hasn't had a headache. What are you doing? What is this? I noticed you put her on a systemic anti-yeast medication. Don't tell me this could be yeast. So I did. And the long and short of that is, um, we're going to incorporate that into today's study because pain is a neurological problem, right? Somehow the synapsis just isn't crossing wires. And then we go into things, and, and uh, I'm going to ask John to put up some graphics here in a few minutes, but we go into some specifics. Uh, multiple sclerosis, what I did for all of you folks, there are many people who suffer with MS. And I'm wondering, I know a couple of neurologists who are very open-minded, one of them in uh, Florida, as a matter of fact, his name is David Perlmutter, and in the 1970s or 80s, I read an article he wrote where he drew, he did a spinal tap. He took cerebral spinal fluid out and tested that. How brilliant is this guy? Tested that for fungus. 
and found yeast. Oh, wow, there he is. David is on the right. That's his son. Talk about a great-looking family. His son is also a physician. Thank you, John. Um, he's written a couple books, and he and I have been friends forever. But he kind of opened my eyes to the fact that neurological problems can have a, imagine this stuff in your tear ducts, imagine it in your cerebral spinal fluid, imagine it in your urine, imagine it in your blood serum, because it's there. And so I want, John's going to uh, show you a few things, uh, a few graphics on that, but before we get started, I want to start the way I ended the last few minutes of a talk I gave in 2018 in Florida. Uh, to ACIM, the Academy of Complementary and Integrative Medicine. I spoke a little bit about them and have for several times, but I, not being a physician, have to very carefully choose my slides. Everyone needs to be referenced. I better study this stuff before I put it up. And I want to give you the last, I don't know, half a dozen slides because uh, it's important that you understand what I taught these doctors. I think every one of you has a doctor's brain. I really do. And I think you're going to get this much more quickly than any physician. And how I hope I could, what's this guy's name? Dr. Gibbs. How I hope and, and pray that Dr. Gibbs a week from now will call me and say, who are you? What is this? What should I do? But this I gave to all the physicians. These are uh, verbatim uh, four years ago, three years ago. The investigative protocol for physicians. First, determine if your patient has been exposed to neurotoxic mycotoxins. I need to preface that. There are over 600 neurological diseases. When I was a kid, it was being a little boyitis. And now there's over 600 neurological uh, diseases, of which we're spending a billion dollars a year on. And it's fair to say, and I said it right here, there is no known cause for any one of them any one of them. That's a boon for the pharmaceutical industry. I believe certain fungi spew poisons, well this is all documented, spew poisons into your bloodstream, into your lungs, and several of these are neurotoxic. Uh, John, do you have that headline from 1945? This is a research paper I took a picture of from 1945, and it says it all. Uh, penicillin was defined as neurotoxic in 1945, and there's the original paper. Penicillin, folks. Penicillin. I don't know how many rounds I've had, 200 in my life. Uh, I don't know how many rounds you've had, but this doctor and you need to think cumulatively. Obviously, you don't get memory loss when you took pen VK as a child or got a shot of penicillin, right? It takes years, it takes decades for the damage done by antibiotics to surface in our body, okay? So here's what I'm gonna, here, I'll, I'll just do this verbatim. <clears throat> From ADHD to Zellweger syndrome, there are now hundreds of neurological disorders. There is no known one cause for all of them. These are the graphics I put up on the, all the TV sets in the room. Ruling out poisonous fungal mycotoxins as an etiological factor is quick, safe, and inexpensive. First, ask your patient to fill out the simple fungal exposure. I now call that the SPORE score questionnaire. It may assist you in diagnosing their fungal disorders. And here's the SPORE, uh, spore score fungal questionnaire. I'll go through them quickly. History of infections and antibiotic intake. Antibiotic resistant infections. Do you drink alcohol? How much? Do you regularly eat grains, sugar, and peanuts? Lived in leaky or moldy environment? Chronic sinusitis? Crohn's disease? Are you allergic to penicillin? Do you feel your immunity is compromised? A history of lung problems like asthma or COPD? Next, I taught the doctors, lean on dietary phenols. Uh, they're plant uh, phytonutrients. Phenolic compounds, and this is out of the Canadian Journal of Plant Pathology, April 2013. Phenolic compounds are ubiquitous in plants, and when plant foods are consumed, these phytochemicals contribute to the intake of natural antioxidants in the human diet. It has been demonstrated 
that phenolic compounds have antifungal properties. So I taught the doctors, look, if you don't know why your patient has Asperger's disease, if you don't know why they're autistic, if you don't know why they have auto, uh, or, uh, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, change their diet. That's what the Kaufman diet is. It has been demonstrated, I quote this, that phenolic compounds have antifungal properties. Plants, green, chlorophyll. Finally, I taught them, starve and stop or kill fungus. Fungi thrive on carbohydrates. The majority of products sold in health food stores from fresh organic vegetables to their supplements have antifungal properties. Deleting foods that feed fungus and using antifungal medications like Diflucan, Sporinox, Nystatin for 10 to 14 days or diet and nutritional supplements for a little longer may quickly, safely, and inexpensively establish a fungal diagnosis and have the patient feeling better in weeks than they have in decades. According to WebMD, I taught, in addition to cancer, Sporinox, we talk about that drug all the time here, itraconazole, treats fungal infections of the esophagus, candidiasis of the oropharyngeal cavity, histoplasmosis, hmm, aspergillosis, fungal infections of the toenail, the fingernail, infections of blastomycete, uh, histoplasmosis, infection due to penicillin, coccidioideomycoses, chromoblastomycoses, uh, infection caused by blastomycetes, ringworm of the scalp, aspergillus, presumed infection of neutropenic patients when they have a fever, fungal infections of the esophagus, fungal infections of the skin with yellow patches, and the list was almost... Uh, what I'm trying to teach these people is, look, you've got a, a 25, 30, or if you're a neurologist, a 99% practice that you don't know the cause of their diseases. And you learn the cause is almost irrelevant. We'll never understand that. We're not smart enough. So give these medicines. Keep giving them these medicines. Then I said when diet and supplements work well and why they work well. Vitamins and minerals are antifungal. Amino acids, antifungal. Fatty acids, you know, things like caprylic acid or omega-3 fatty acid, <clears throat> antifungal, antifungal. Fresh vegetables and fruits antifungal. Coconut oils, antifungal. Spices, antifungal. Zinc, antimycotoxin anti and antifungal. Garlic, antimycotoxin and antifungal. Citrus oils, antimycotoxin and antifungal. Essential oils, antifungal. Probiotics are antifungal, yada, yada, yada. Mycotoxin deactivators, supplements that inhibit fungal growth. Psyllium binds mycotoxins. I take it at night before I go to bed. Activated charcoal, bentonite clay, NAC, N-acetylcysteine, the precursor to glutathione, alpha-lipoic acid, glutathione, curcumin, transresveratrol, chlorophyll is chemoprotective. Wow. Zinc, garlic, etc., etc., etc. And finally, every presenter, all the doctors and me that presented, have to end up with one graphic that gives you clinical pearls. Clinical pearls as a salute. Your presentation is done. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with me. Here are Doug Kaufman's clinical pearls. Certain fungi produce neurotoxic poisons called mycotoxins. Neurotoxic mycotoxins can alter the behavior of their host in favor of their own survival. You guys think about this one. I'm craving sugar. I can't remember stuff. Senile dementia. I have Parkinson's. You know, I uh, a fungal disorder. You know me. You've been with me for a while. Neurotoxic mycotoxins alter the behavior of their host in favor of their own survival. They're not letting go. Plenty of sugar coming in, 98.6 inside here, and from time to time they can drive that up to 100, 101. Through diet, inhalation, and certain medications, we humans are commonly exposed to neurotoxic fungal mycotoxins. Ruling out fungus as the cause often can be done within 30 days by changing the diet and using antifungal medications or natural supplements. Uh, folks, I bring all of this to your attention. I bought in a bookstore, I don't know, 100 years ago, a book called The Handbook of Toxicology. You learn, I learned in chemistry, right? We all learned in elementary school. Toxicology meant what? Poison. 
the Handbook of Toxicology. This book was actually, and it's circa 1957, I think. Yeah, June 1957. Division of Biology and Agricultural, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Research Council, June 1957. And I picked this up in the store, you know, long, long ago, and I began to study it. Folks, what's listed in here are the uh, 200 or so antibiotics that were on the market, there's now thousands, in 1957. You see, antibiotics are myco toxicology. They're fungal poisons. Now, don't let that scare you. They've got to burst apart living organisms called bacteria, pathogenic living organisms, but they go a step beyond that. They burst apart good bacteria that God put our intestines. And so we've got a whole world of hurt here. What this did was determine the LD50. Those of you in, in science understand what that is the lethal dose that will kill of that specific antibiotic, penicillin, erythromycin, that will kill 50% of the mice. Uh, you know, per kilogram of body weight, they then give it to kids, give it to you and me as adults and so forth. So they have to establish, and they did this 70 years ago, 65 years ago, they have to establish a dose that they can give to kids and give to, you know, uh, we adults that won't kill us. So you have to drop below the LD50 in children and adults, right? You don't want to kill 50% of them. I need you to know, though, that antibiotics are fungal metabolites. The metabolites are specifically called mycotoxins. Here's been my concern forever since I learned this as a, a younger man. Gee, I've been on lots of antibiotics. I remember in the military, we all had to take like 10 cc's of penicillin in our hip. Why? Because we were in boot camp. We were owned by the pharmaceutical companies, the government. And so when they said, drop your doors, we're going to give you 10 cc's of penicillin, you just did it. And before that, my uncle was an important doctor at, at one of the big hospitals. Um, we were on antibiotics a lot. It's the cumulative. You're sitting there with uh, secondary multiple sclerosis. You're sitting there with you know, Parkinson's. Your gait is off. You're sitting there like this doctor, worried that he only has a few years left to live and it's going to be miserable, he won't be able to remember anything, or you have dementia or senile dementia, or you have autism, or your loved one does. The one thing you have to start assessing is this. Another book. I have the strangest books. When I die, somebody gather all these. The genus Penicillin. Penicillium. And just understand this, penicillium is the mold that Dr. Fleming found in 1928 that fell down from old oranges into his bacterial research lab. And when he came back, all his bacteria on the plates were dead. And he thought, well, I forgot to inoculate him with bacteria, or I forgot to put the lid on. Nonsense. The mold fell down on his bacteria and killed it. Along came, 20 years later, antibiotics. But this is an epic book. John Pitt, I believe, is still alive in Australia, and I just want to read you one sentence, and I've used this in my lectures to all of these doctors. <clears throat> it is ironic that this humbled fungus hailed, it, this is penicillin, from which we get hundreds of derivatives, penicillin. It is ironic that this humbled fungus hailed as a benefactor of mankind may by its very success prove to be a deciding factor in the decline of present civilization. I scoffed. The book was written in 80 or something, 81. <clears throat> like, penicillin is going to put us all out. I got to tell you, folks. I got to tell you. We need to think not about a dose. I took one in 2017. Not a dose of an antibiotic. We have to start thinking like we think about alcohol. This is cumulative alcohol. You don't have a glass of wine and fall down and vomit. It's cumulative. We all learned, or many of us learned at a young age, man, I was so naive, um, that you, alcohol is neurotoxic, right? What is it uh, that we don't get? I'll never forget on my radio show, this doctor called in and he says, so you think you know, fungus is everything, that neurotoxic mycotoxins cause all these problems. 
And I said, hey, I got a hard break coming up in 30 seconds, Doc, stick with me. And will you do me a favor? It's a three minute ad. If you have a six pack in the refrigerator, drink it down quickly and then get back on the phone with us, thanks. And he, he hung up. I was probably a little rude to him and I didn't mean to be, but what I wanted to do is prove the point. A little bit of alcohol, look, cardiologists, internal medicine guys have argued for decades that it's good. And that's because, two words, they drink. Of course it's good, I'm not dead. I'm 50 years old and I'm a researcher in medicine. I love my beer, I love my alcohol. Um, alcohol, antibiotics, cigarettes loaded with mold. Gee, I wonder what causes lung cancer. Cigarettes. The danger lies in observing the effect and believing it's the cause. Oh, those darn cigarettes are causing lung cancer. Eh. I'll never forget when Dr. Costantini, John, you'd have fallen in love with this guy. Um, we were in Canada. He was putting on a seminar at all these doctors and me. And uh, he said, uh, I challenge anyone to prove to me that cigarettes cause lung cancer. You should, and I'm sitting in the back because I'm kind of, the, you know, and I'm looking at all these doctors, looking at each other and laughing, sneering. Yeah, right. Like all of us know that we all have patients who smoke and they end up with lung cancer, right? It's not the tobacco. That's a leaf God put on the earth. It's what man does to it, right? Dip it in sugar and other things, roll it tight and hermetically seal it so it has a chance to ferment and grow mold on it in the tight package. I'll never forget Dad. Dad smoked and smoked and smoked and he'd tear off that cellophane and then that little chrome thing on the top and he'd hit the cigarettes a few times, one would pop out and he'd light one off the other. A tremendous man, but not a man of science. You guys have to remember in 1949, the year I was born, four out of five doctors were proud of the fact that they smoked camels. Okay, so it's the cumulative effect of corn, I'll go into that, and wheat, and peanuts, sunflower seeds, pistachios, um, alcohol, antibiotics, things we're talking about today, cigarettes, that lead to neurodegeneration. It's not the first drink you have. It's not the first antibiotic. Again, the damage, let me teach you something. When you swallow an antibiotic, it's an indiscriminate bacteria killer. Thank God it kills the pathogenic, we mean the bad bacteria. But it kills commensal or uh, it kills the good guys too. And we're supposed to have that good guy to make some of the important vitamins for energy and strength and neurocognition and so forth. But with all that bacteria gone, we start a slow walk into the abyss, into illness. Okay, and that's what, in looking for a cause and effect to cancer, I'll never forget Richard Nixon. I was home with my parents. Uh, we're going 1969 or something. We're going to war. We're going to war with cancer. We're funding a billion dollars a year, and we're going to defeat this cancer. Here we are today, more cancer than ever before. And of course, that's being blamed on COVID. You're not going in and getting your mammogram. We're going to see explosion of cancer. We might have some interesting insight into that. This I thought was interesting. It was published in a journal called Mutation Research. Good journal. And it was published in 1999, their issue 424. And I'm going to quote it. Mycotoxins, antibiotics, alcohol. Mycotoxins are toxic fungal metabolites which are structurally diverse, they are, and common contaminants of the ingredients of animal feed and human food. I got to tell you, I'm not one... I have a cat, it eats, I told you what it eats. That cat was a dead cat three or four years ago, maybe five years ago, it is a kitten now. And it runs around the house like a kitten. If your dog, your cat are sick, itchy skin, immune deficit, grown lumps all over their body, change their diet. You see, the FDA says we can have, I don't know, one part per billion, but animals get like 10 parts per billion. So if our corn that comes in has too many mycotoxins, no, don't give it to humans. Give it to a little tiny kitten 
or a dog this big? So think that through. I digress, though. I want you to know that we are doing a significant amount of damage, in my opinion, with our fork and our spoon. I've said this before. I'll say it again. We get a choice. We can use our fork and spoon to begin today digging our grave. Eh, it's going to take 20, 30 years. Or we can use that fork and spoon to implement good health by making sure what we put on that fork and in that spoon are good, healthy, nutritious foods, not what's available today. Doesn't anybody care? I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I look at fast foods and genetically modified foods and egregious foods, and I think, doesn't anybody, but the FDA has approved them. And I look at medical procedures. We know we overdid tonsillectomies. We overdid hysterectomies. We're overdoing all sorts of hip replacements. Look, it's in the news. We're overdoing it. So what? Doesn't anybody care? That's what I'm here to teach you today so that you can, if you're young, teach your children and your grandchildren 20 years from now. Thank you, John. Should we put up those? I think those are, yeah, okay, let's, let's put those up. The, the questions out of this audience. You guys don't need me anymore. I think you got it. You pretty well got it. By the way, we've had thousands join us. So I do the show, there's a few hundred people that watch, 100, 200, sometimes 300. But then you look at the numbers the next day and you're just floored how many people jump on later or forward this to their friends. Um, let me start this way. Ah. Oh. Does fungus cause some of these neurological diseases? John has five graphics he's going to put up right now, starting with autism. Okay? Autism and fungal exposure. I want you to look, before I could post these, they had to be, you know, referenced. Neurotoxicology, what a major journal. Study of 47, 79 Swedish children, which followed them for five years between ages one to three, and then six to eight reported that home bedroom water condensation in windows and walls was associated with an increased risk, five years, 72 children, of autism spectrum disorder in a journal called Neurotoxicology. What they were saying, folks, in essence is this. Mold, condensation. The wood got wet, cellulose is sugar for mold, and it starts eating the wood, and these little spores go off. We lift the window, or let the bathtub overflow a little, or flush the toilet, and it keeps on flushing, or we got a <clears throat> leak in our ceiling, and all of a sudden the little kids are running through the living room inhaling mold spores. Show me a pediatrician that knows this. Okay, John, let's go to the next one. Does inhaling mold contribute to depression? This one will knock you out of your chair. Study, again, big study, almost 6,000 adults. We thought that once we statistically accounted for factors that could uh, clearly contribute to depression, you know, employment status, crowding, etc., we would see any link to depression and fungus vanish, said Shanessa, the lead author of the study and associate professor of the Department of Community Health at Brown University. But the opposite was true. We found a solid association between depression and living in a damp, moldy home. Can I get an amen? Uh, folks, your daughter calls you, Mom, I feel so, I just don't know how long I can go on. The last question out of a loving mother or loving father's mouth is, walk over to your window. Is it dripping wet? What's the humidity in that room? Do you remember when you and Jim had that leak in the living room? Did that ever, oh yeah, yeah, we got up there and put an old coffee can in there. Did you ever clean the car? No, they dried out eventually, folks. I thought this was good because of the root. Brown University, respected university, saying this stuff. We thought it was hocus pocus, but the opposite was true. We found a solid association between depression and mold. That's what I'm trying to teach. Now walk that mold one step further. Antibiotics, alcohol. Mold grows pretty commonly in our corn supply. And everything's corn, including the gasoline that we put in our cars. 
Okay, next. Fungus found in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. A Spanish team of medical researchers, this one is amazing, examined the uh, brain and blood vessels of 21 cadavers, investigating their cause of death. In 11, they discovered several fungal species growing in the brains and other tissues, while the other 10 had no fungal growth. Ironically, the 11 cadavers with fungal growth all died of Alzheimer's disease. None of the remaining 10 died of the disease. This is what we call in research a home run. But no, this got swept under the carpet. Oh, you can't tell me. There are none so blind as those who get funding to develop new drugs for Alzheimer's. Who wants to know the cause? Is this a slam dunk? You've got 21 cadavers. You tell the pathologist, go in there and you do cadaver stuff. Tell us what's in their blood, in their body. Well, we don't know, Doc, what they died of, right? You held that from us. But 11 of these cadavers have mold growing in their bodies. Patient one, patient four, patient six, patient seven. Can you imagine the group who realize it's 100%? 100% of that small study, uh, small study, 21 patients. And why didn't you go any further? This was a decade ago. Not true. It's uh, six years ago. Who's doing more? Shh, new drugs coming out. Next one, Johnny. <clears throat> I told you before that mycotoxins are tremorigenic. They induce tremors, consistent with Parkinson's disease. It is possible that low exposure to aquatoxin A, and you find this, well, we'll keep going, will result in an earlier onset of Parkinsonians, where normal age-dependent decline striatal dopamine levels are superimposed on the mycotoxin-induced lesions. And look at the bottom, Journal of Neurological Science. Acrotoxin A is a mycotoxin produced by several fungal species, like penicillium and aspergillus. Acrotoxin A impregnates cereal grains and dried foods, uh, fruits and shelled nuts. Are we eating ourselves? Are we inhaling ourselves? Are we medicating ourselves into headaches, into depression? In the excruciating back, I don't know, mom, he did a, he did an x-ray on me and he poked some needles in there and he said it looks absolutely fine. I'm so depressed. They cannot figure out why I wake up in the morning so stiff I can't even walk. I walk to the bathroom like an old man. They can't see it. It's invisible. What makes bread rise? Could that same yeast be in your coccyx, the tailbone, and be hitting on the nerves around it while you sleep, while you're unconscious. Sure, it makes bread rise. It can make the tissue around the coccyx or the lumbar surfaces rise. And you wake up in the morning and, oh, oh, I can't stand this. Or I've got fluid in my eye and I can't, you're unconscious, you're sleeping. And these little geese love 98.6 degrees and they love the vitreous humor, the liquid in your eye, hot tubs while you're sleeping. This is a science they don't get, and yet the one thing I had to do through the years, and I hope you'll carry this on for me, is I had to document. When I am in there, or in your master bath, put it in there, and watch in a few days the green, gray, black fuzz that starts growing. Aha! Why can't a doctor recommend this? Because he or she didn't learn it in medical training. It's really that simple. Again, respect them twice my IQ, uh, but I'll read you where they go with this, okay? Next, cereal grains. You guys eating a bagel, eating pasta, eating cereal in the morning? Uh, next is peanuts, peanut butter. Next is antibiotics. We've all taken antibiotics, and I consumed in my 20s when I got back in Vietnam Probably, the two go together, don't they? The two A's at the bottom there, antibiotics and alcohol. When you drink alcohol, your immune system is upended, right? And so you just simply go to a doctor. What's a doctor going to give you? An antibiotic. They say that one and one in mycology never equals two. They say that one and one equals 15. 
because it's 15 times greater when you're exposed to dual mycotoxins, your risk of disease. Think about this. In my, I came home from Vietnam, I was 21. John, I told you this story. Um, they told me I had, you know, uh, uh, some kind of psychological uh, post-traumatic stress. I, you know, I didn't see anything. Uh, the 19, 20 year old guys over there didn't see. Um, and so I, I couldn't believe that. But I found that alcohol calmed me. I could sleep. I didn't jump. I woke up some nights with my legs flailing, my arms flailing. Was that post-traumatic stress? I don't know. I don't have any idea. On the uh, Parkinson's graphic, it has mixed nuts. It has the arachotoxin in it. Mm -hmm. But the mixed nuts is still in the phase one and two. Kaufman die, yeah. And it, it said the shell. But, so. but John, all nuts, you think about almonds, they're shelled. And I've been, on, I've been very vocal about that. I won't eat carob or chocolate-covered almonds because you sell the good almonds that look good unexposed, right? And then you wrap the others sometimes in chocolate or something like that. They have to be very careful. You can see uh, walnuts. Uh, we just learned three, four years ago that sunflower seeds. I could, any of you guys remember, do you ever sit in your car driving along with, and you got a handful of sunflower seeds, you roll a window, you blow the seeds outside, right? Or you put them in the ashtray. And every once in a while you'd get a zinger. You'd chew on them and go, whoa, mycotoxins. You have to be careful. Now, you know, I, I think almonds, they're high risk and low risk. High risk is pistachio, I have learned in the past 20 years. But peanuts, the medical literature is replete with be careful of peanuts. So many Americans are, purport to be allergic to peanuts. I think what they ate was a mycotoxin and that can cause immediate type reaction, anaphylaxis. So I eat nuts. The other night when I got home from Austin, I sat and ate and I go through them and look at them. If they got black stuff or ugly, I just throw them away. Uh, so you have to be careful. You've got to be vigilant. But nuts are such a good source of protein, amino acids. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to throw them away. Um, okay. And you have questions. Okay, can I just ask you guys now, let's come full cycle. I have so much more to say. There was so, let me just read you something. And then I want to ask you what you'd do if you were Dr. Gibbs. I pulled this out today at circa 2011, a decade ago now, Mechanisms of Mycotoxin-Induced Neurotoxicity. These are the kind of papers I read and kind of enjoy. I'm a sick man that way. Through oxidative stress and associated pathways. The medical community thinks everything is oxidation, right? The nutritional community thinks everything is hyperoxidation. I believe mycotoxins lead to oxidative damage and oxidative stress, but you have to hear their point. Published in the International Journal of Molecular Science, 2011. Now remember, in addressing all of this, what I say, mycotoxin, mycotoxin, mycotox, autism, mycotoxin, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Here's their answer. <clears throat> Among many mycotoxins, the T2 toxin, uh, macrocyclic trichothecenes, fumonisin B1, fumonisin B2, and acrotoxin A are known to have potential to induce neurotoxicity in rodent models. T2 toxin induces neuronal cell apoptosis in the fetal and adult brain. Macrocyclic trichothecenes bring about neuronal cell apoptosis and inflammation of the olfactory epithelium and the olfactory bulb. Uh, uh, FB, uh, that would be fumonisin B1, induces uh, neuronal degeneration in the cerebral cortex, concurrent with disruption of de novo ceramide synthesis. Acrotoxin A causes acute depletion of striatal dopamine and its metabolites, accompanying evidence of neuronal cell apoptosis and substriatal nigra, strandium, and hippocampus. This paper, the point I want to make is this is what a scientist says. I say, careful of antibiotics. Don't smoke. Stop drinking now. Change your diet and eat more greens. Their language and mine are just diametric. In emergency training, you know, we had to learn all these words. I have since long forgotten all these words. I told you that 
Itraconazole all Sporinox, they're on fire about it because it inhibits the hedgehog pathway. I had to look that up. I'm picturing a hedgehog in a hole in the dirt. Apparently, cancer cells travel down a man-named pathway called the hedgehog. Doug says cancer is fungus. That's why Sporinox helps. They say, oh, it seems to block off the hole in the dirt so the little hedgehog can't get down there and the cancer pauses for a period of time. I need you to know how they think. It's important to know how they think. They think polysyllable, high-tech stuff. Sometimes do you think we're far too technical in the world and in medicine? Because I do. Okay? Okay, now, let's see if we can get... I did pretty good, John. Give me a little credit here. Wow, lots of text coming in. Sorry. Karen asks, can you give your opinion on these for weight loss resistance? DNA tests versus IgG. I know I have food sensitivity. Okay, good question, Karen. You're looking at the guy who in the late 70s developed IgG food testing. I can tell you a lot about it. Dr. Richard K. Wright at UCLA, I employed Sudaba Etasami, Aristo Wajdani. I had these incredible, I, we were near UCLA in Los Angeles. On occasion, I'd go over there and meet these immunologists. Hey, what are you doing? You know, take it lunch. Yeah, I have this little lab. We're studying binding of food, covalent binding of food proteins to a polystyrene disc. Uh, and then we're testing patients. Take a tube of blood, spin it down, pull the Buffy coat, the white cells, and the serum. And we're testing for the presence of antibodies, uh, IgG antibodies to foods. Um, he, uh, Karen... This is going to be a thumbnail sketch. Otherwise, you know, I could go another hour talking to you about food allergy. I wrote a book that sold quite well on it. I found out that most people react to corn and yeast. Gee, I wonder why. And the most important thing I've learned, you know, in the past decades is food allergy exists simultaneous with gut hyperpermeability. The reason I, I sat down with so many people, we did these IgG and IgG4 tests for many doctors, and the doctors were my friends. Uh, and they'd sit down with me and say, gee, your test, the last three patients have said, that's everything I eat. And I thought, that's weird. How could they be allergic to everything they eat? They have little openings in the gut, and they chew up the eggs and swallow the milk and chew up the bread, and all of a sudden they're allergic to milk, eggs, and bread wheat, right? Because tiny, and then in 1980, a research paper came across my desk. I mean, antigenically intact food macromolecules exiting the gut lumen. And they had high uh, power microscopes showing food, antigenically wheat, corn, exiting the barrier in the intestine, being readily picked up by blood cells where an antibody was made. When we test for anti-corn antibodies, IgG, IgM, or others, what we're testing for is we found that food in your gut. Are these food allergies? Because what the doctors told me is they'd have another retest done in a couple of months because they weren't feeling so well, and now the new foods they're eating are being picked up. And it didn't take me long to figure out, are we just detecting foods that are leaking through the gut and antibodies, white blood cell, uh, T, B cell antibodies, B cell antibodies are being made. And so I got out of that field. And uh, once I, here's, here's the truth, here's what happened in the 70s. A concurrent paper showed uh, mycelium, stage, yeast, candida, and others, long threads of yeast poking a hole through the gut. And my brain started saying, wait a minute, how do holes get in a human intestine? And I went back to the 70s, 75, 76, the work I was doing with Dr. Hughes at USC Medical. And I remember those papers. So yeast in the gut, and finally, old medical textbooks like these, 1957, taught me that antibiotics are mycotoxins. 
They can encourage candida growth in the intestine. Mycelium growth, active state growth, change from a commensal harmless yeast to a pathogen in the body, hyphae grow, poke a hole through the intestine, and everybody's got food allergy. The business was a boom for me, but I could no longer do it. I kind of figured out how food allergy happens. Seal the gut. How do we do that? Thank you, John. John, you're a gentleman and a scholar. You working out today? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Me too. You seal up the gut. First of all, a mother's breast milk, colostrum, the best cement known to man. Not only immune cells, but cement, so the gut doesn't leak. Generally, people who have food hypersensitivity were not breastfed, but we're finding colostrum, bovine colostrum, um, from, I need to say this, from non-antibiotic fed or corn fed, uh, cows is a pretty good way to seal up the gut. Then look at something called psyllium, P-S-Y-L-L-I-U-M, and finally the amino acid L-glutamine, G-L-U-T-A-M-I-N-E. Those three things in a few months are a pretty good way of sealing up the gut. Karen, I'm sorry I dwelled on that so long, but um, either food sensitivity or sealing up gut. Okay. Hello, Doug says, Eddie, greetings from Chile. Eddie, great to be with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Eddie, it's your job to go through that beautiful country and teach people this, okay? I'll send you a little pin. I am a mycologist. Um, what do I think about nebulizing iodine or peroxide? It's, uh, we all represent a thumbprint. Joanne, I don't, know what your health problems might be. I don't know how strong your lungs are. I encourage, in the year 2022, I'm, I really would like to get together with a whole bunch of naturopathic doctors, chiropractors, because I think in cases like these, when we're nebulizing food grade hydrogen peroxide, um, I'd like to know nasal pharyngeal, is that okay? Lungs, pulmonary tissues, are those okay? And I'd like a health professional, I, I want to say a general statement, I've heard of that done, I know doctor friends who do that and have their patients do it, but I don't know Joanne, and I'm not a doctor, so I can't make that call. But eventually, if, if you'll find a good naturopathic doctor or a chiropractor who understands nutrition, uh, they can check those tissues out and then give you thumbs up or thumbs down based on your own tissue. Rolla says, hey Doug, I finally found your program on my TV channel lineup again after years of not having it available. What would that be, John? Impact TV. Impact TV. Purportedly 93 million households. Were we on Impact before? John, that's great. Uh, welcome back, Rolla. Happy to have you here. It's on at 6.30 a.m., so I try and catch it when I'm awake. <laughs> It's nice to be able to view your program again on TV. God bless you, Rolla. Thank you. Um, my audience is not the hip-hop audience. You heard me say I was a ball of alcohol and, you know, and cookies when I was a hip-hopper. Uh, my audience is those of us who are facing our mortality and getting there doesn't scare us much because we know where we're going to end up. But the process of aching and hurting and having doctors say, we don't know, but here's an antidepressant, it gets very disconcerting to us. Uh, and my, that means Christian family television uh, are the uh, networks that we buy. We don't have a 501c3. We're not a ministry. So we don't get free programming. We pay to play on all these. Uh, and thank you, by the way, thank, this guy gets a big hug. Last night, I get a phone call from Chris Chase. Um, you guys know this, Pioneer, right? Now, I got to tell you, right, some of you guys are saying, you know, I'm really mad at that guy. Um, I tried to call them for months and months. The supply chain almost shut his business down. As a matter of fact, if it would have gone a few more weeks, it would have. I think that's the coolest little portable air cleaner 
and I'm telling you this truthfully, not because he's an advertiser, but it shocks me that 21 years ago he began advertising on Know the Cause, and I haven't seen any photocatalytic device that spews you know, negative ions to trap positive ions in your bedroom, in your house, in your apartment, like this. There's some coming out, I see them all the time in the social media uh, uh, houses, but these things are $1,500, $2,000, $3,000, $5,000. This is the best thing we've ever put in our home. This little cannula, you just shut it off, the light goes off. This thing pulls out and every year or two, you put a new bulb in. Um, and I, so Chris called me and he said, Doug, I'm not gonna let this company die. And uh, he ordered in May, like a few thousand replacement bulbs because he sold so many of them and people knew the bulbs. The point I wanna make, don't give up on Chris. I wish, I hope he's an advertiser of mine next year. Currently he is not. But I told him I would mention it to you and we made an ad for television for him. I'm an elephant. I don't forget a guy who's paid me for 20 years and then his company darn near went out and, uh, and they survived. Isn't that great? Did you mention Pioneer.net? For some reason, yeah. I can't type it on. Oh, it's, uh, guys, you talk about a Christmas gift? Um, several years ago, I got both of my children these. And when I was in LA recently, my son said, Dad, you gave me this Pioneer. This is the gift that gives to us every day clean air in your home. Um, do consider it, folks. And he has them available, which is a mind blower. Uh, they're so good. Uh, so I, of course, ordered another one. I said, Chris, you're serious? I was, wa my home doesn't, Wi-Fi isn't very good, and I'm, I walk outside to talk on the phone. And I was out there 45 minutes last night talking to Chris. His company is gonna survive. He's put a lot of money into it. The technology is going to survive, and you will love it. Pioneer, now it's spelled differently. It's not Pioneer. Pioneer, P-I-O-N-A-I-R, P-I-O-N-A-I-R dot net. Um, know the cause isn't on it, I'm not on it, uh, but he finally, seven months later, got his shipment in, he was like a little boy, he was so excited. Most companies uh, would have fallen. I don't know what I would have done if he goes away because I see these big obtrusive uh, canisters and so forth, probably good units, but this is so tiny, you can plug it in your master bedroom tonight, put it where the cat's box is tomorrow, give it to the kids to take to school the next day. It's a wonderful, wonderful device. Shameless advertising, I know, but pioneer.net, pioneer.net. Great Christmas gift, and he can get them to you on time. Okay, Beth says, between antibiotics and anesthesia, seven surgeries in five years. It's a wonder I can think straight. <laughs> but you do, Beth. Still challenging my brain daily. Taking Dr. O'Hara's probiotics, antifungal supplements, trying to stay on your number one diet, Doug. Thank you for sharing. Keep up the great work, and God bless you. And he does bless me with friends like you guys. Oh, my son and thousands more have multiple chemical sensitivities. Oh, as the crow flies 10 miles from them. And they came to see us. And there were people with diagnosed multiple chemical hypersensitivity who got better on an antifungal program. I just feel I need to tell you that. We're, we're being labeled, gee, I can't walk into a store with effervescent, or uh, effervescent, with fluorescent lights. Um, I can't wear perfumes, my deodorant, you know. I know the stories. I've seen hundreds of doctors' patients like this. Sometimes if you dig under that, you'll find there's an etiological factor. The doctor who diagnosed multiple chemical hypersensitivity doesn't know about. Could the, you've watched today, D, could the antibiotics that he took as a little boy, is he 21, 22? I can't tell you how many mothers and dads at the big hospital out here I saw, only six months or a year later, I would see their children. And their children are now 18, 19, and they've got all sorts of health problems. I never let, 
I always let mom and dad come in because they got to tell their story, you know, to the doctors and to their child. But when I got the child alone, I need to ask you a question because I had a problem with this when I was younger. Do you drink? You know, you see their eyes, male and female. Uh, you know, I went to a party, had a couple of drinks. I really don't like it. Oh, good. So you've only drank once. Okay, so usually, you see where I'm going with this. Under lying multiple chemical sensitivity or arthritis or blepharospasms or hair falling out or horrible tummy problems or lump growing on your neck underlying these can sometimes be yeast um, and it's probably time to sit if, folks I got a 13 books I mean I've written a lot about this um, probably time to sit down with your son and take a real decent look at his diet, at his activity, uh, at his antibiotic intake. Because if a child, you saw today, cereal, oh, just unbelievable. Um, if he changed this morning, I ate a whole grapefruit, cut it in half, gobbled it down, squeezed the juice, took some of my supplements with it. So simple. I know we all have labels. You have hip dysplasia. You have AFib. You have diabetes. Do you see we're playing the same game that medicine is? You need a pill. You need a pill. You need a different pill. Here you're staring down the pipe at a 72-year-old guy who feels better at 72 than I did at 32 because I've straightened out my lifestyle choices. And sometimes our kids and we need to do the same. I'm, you know, um, I'm not a guy who's going to point a finger and slap you on the hand and say, you need, even my own kids, I wouldn't do that. We all learn in our own time. It is so exciting when a young person learns that there's a cause and effect relationship between, and you fill in the blank. I've had people who used a toothpaste, who had gum bleeding for years and years, and I recommended baking soda and thyme, a couple drops of thyme, you know, and their gum stopped bleeding. I've seen it all. Um, sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart because underlying multiple chemical hypersensitivity may be a bad fungal problem. Okay? I hope that helps. <clears throat> Is there a blood test to check for fungus? Yeah. Um, and we've talked a lot about this. There, we humans make five protective antibodies. Game D. I-G-G, A, M, E, and D. D is, we're learning more about D. A is secretory. E is the allergy antibody. I-G-G is what we call a long-term exposure antibody. And then I-G-M, I think, is the relevant one. There are laboratories who do mycology testing, fungal testing. Some of them have crossed the river. They're now doing fungal testing like aspergillus, and then it's mycotoxin testing, you know, like uh, aflatoxin. There are laboratories who can do mycology panels with both fungus, candida, etc., uh, and their mycotoxins. And uh, I think that's very accurate. And here's what I want to teach everybody, and the doctors would be very mad at me for saying this. When you get a laboratory test result back in which antibodies are elicited, IgG, every lab tests for IgG, and I don't know why, doesn't tell you a whole lot. Uh, you have Epstein-Barr, IgG antibodies to Epstein-Barr. Well, when I was a kid, that was called mononucleosis. So the little guy behind me sneezed on my jacket, I touched it, I got mononucleosis antibodies, but that was 70 years ago. So it's really an antibody I'm not really interested in. If you get antibody testing for anything, Doug, I want to know if this is herpes on my lip. I'm going to go have an anti-herpes antibody. Make it an IgM, because an IgG is going to tell you, yep, you've got antibodies to IgG. And this goes back to my food allergy testing days. Yep, you've got antibodies to IgG. But is that causing these herpes? IgM. First few weeks, you make an IgM antibody. Aha, a cause and effect relationship. Okay, Nat, I hope that helps. 
Uh, Sherry says, oh no, oh gee, a PA, a physician's assistant, gave me an antibiotic for my toe fungus. Ridiculous. Made it worse. Um, if you're a person who is taking a lot of antibiotics, now again, I'm not a doctor, I can't tell you what to do. If you're a person who's taken lots of antibiotics and your condition isn't gone, and in fact, retrospectively, is worse, you need to talk to that doctor. Better, you need to take, it's on, type this in, the CDC Think Fungus. Type it into a search engine. Print it, take it to the doctor. Because the CDC is now telling you and me and our doctors, if those pills aren't getting you better, think fungus. What they're saying is if antibiotics aren't working, um, think fungus. Uh, Sherry, there's no shortage of PAs. They learn like doctors and nurses, and I did, you know, 100 years ago. No shortage of them that think antibiotics. Very few. You met one, my friend Mark, here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, very few PAs who understand that if an infection doesn't respond favorably to an antibacterial drug, think antifungal. Okay? Hope that helps. <clears throat> wow, Gloria, my son was just diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Obviously, doctor wants to remove it. Fungus correlation, I don't know. I think fungi... Uh, can impregnate any human tissue except the teeth, thyroid, parathyroid included. On an x-ray, it might look like thyroid cancer. If they've done a biopsy on it, the one thing I would do if this were my son, I'd call the hospital. You have to wrap the remaining tissue in paraffin and save it. I'd ask the hospital that did the biopsy if they could send it to a laboratory that does mycology testing. Thank you, John. Uh, fungus testing, and see, perchance, if Aspergillus or Fusarium or Penicillium or Candida is detected in that tumor, in that lump. I mean, that's what I would do. Um, and that would answer your question, wouldn't it? Obviously, the doctor wants it removed. Is there a fungus correlation? I'm thinking right now of a dear friend who I know is listening um, out in Louisiana. Anne, who uh, had her thyroid removed many, many years ago and just has had so many uh, problems with it. And we don't know. This was so long ago. You can't. Once a tissue is removed, once a plunger, a needle goes into your arm and the plunger is pushed, you can't simply pull the plunger back the day later and say, yeah, I thought about it. Mm. Don't really want. You can't just say, wow, I'm feeling so much better without my thyroid. Hopefully that would be the path. But there have got to be a lot of people who said, man, I don't know if I would have done that if I had an option. Is fungus an option? Easy to test for it. Someone has wrapped in wax that biopsy the doctor did. That's what I would do. Yeah, Connie, I hear you. Okay, Connie, a lot of problems with fluid behind my ears, and it becomes inflamed. I try for 10 days to doctor myself before finally going in to get an antibiotic. I hate having to do that, but sometimes uh, it'll help. I don't blame you. What could possibly do to stop this ear problem? Had antibiotics two weeks ago, now the ears are hurting again. This is going to sound crazy. I'll be called the biggest quack in the world, but I have broad shoulders. Ear candle. It doesn't breach the tympanic membrane. It, it, an ear can't... Cerumen is that wax that grows in our ear. It's protective. You know, it's good. But hyperceruminosis is a real medical condition I saw while working in L.A. in ear, nose, and throat clinics. Um, an ear candle, and they'll show you, you know, you cut a hole in a little paper dish, and you got this long candle, paraffin wax candle. You lay on somebody's lap, you put this... You put your head sideways here, you put the dish and then the candle, and you light the end of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. You light the end of it, and within three or four minutes, it's burned down halfway. You turn over, put it in the other ear. Uh, I used to recommend that. I heard an ear, nose, and throat doctor in California, not the guy I worked for, but another one, recommend it. 
And then I saw that patient, and she was a celebrity, you guys would know her. I saw her a couple of weeks later, and she was on fire that her dizziness was a cerumen problem in her ear. Ear candles? Uh, you know, I would look at some kind of an antimicrobial drop, and there are a lot of good ones on the market today. Um, that's the way I would go, clean the ears out thoroughly. This will not breach what we call the tympanic membrane, the eardrum, so don't worry about that and get into the inner ear. But could a clot contribute? You know, just push this little thing on your ear back, hold it down, and everybody will know what Connie's going through, the echo, etc. Could a clot of cerumen be inducing that? One way to tell. And I hope that helps. Um, yeah, Monica, you and I uh, just recently learned that we've had GMOs since 1996. I can only imagine the damage that's been done to our bodies and how uh, we're used to that uh, without that question. Really sad. Uh, Monica, so I'm going to be for a minute an FDA official. Yeah, they approved these decades ago. Because you know how important it is to feed the world. America's responsibility is to feed the world. And so we're going to have genetically modified rice crops and corn crops and wheat crops, and we're going to feed the world. Not so sure that ever happened, but I'm sure big industry entered this uh, field. Here's the cool thing. I only shop in health stores. Genetically modified crops are everywhere. If you're eating soybeans or tomatoes, you're eating GMOs. Unless you're getting uh, food from a health food store, certified organic, non-GMO. We have right uh, five minutes from here. We have a guy whose wife got cancer. They made it through the cancer with changing her diet and living a strong life. And they closed their businesses down. Uh, their personal businesses, and open a health food store. This was 10 years ago. And that's where we shop. We are thrilled to give money locally, number one. But number two, we totally support eating that way. Where this is going, Monica, I've got to tell you, um, we all have to have a little plot of land. And that can be a condominium with some dirt trays out. You've got to grow your own anymore. That's where nobody cares. The FDA's argument is, we don't see people dying from genetically modified organisms. Can I trim this back for you a little bit? I read a book, and in the opening verse of the book, it's called Genesis, in the opening verse of the book, it says, with seed of like kind. Fruit with seed of like kind. Diametric to those words are genetically modified seeds. Okay, I hope that helps. And you're right, it is really sad, but here's the cool thing. This is still America. Uh, and I can choose to pay a buck more and not eat those, and I do. What can you do for dogs, asked Dolores. Yeah, there's three questions there. Oh, Cindy's got one. Dolores has one. Barbie has one. Oh, this is really good. Uh, what can you do for dogs? Uh, someone was asking about diet page about cats. Uh, Barbie asked, do you have any supplements to your homemade cat food? Yeah, we are putting in. We were talking about mold in the homes and that kind of thing with the air. Mm. That's, that's what they asked. Thank you, John. The first things to go when you have a very bad air quality in your home are birds followed by cats, followed by dogs. The tinier they are, the more impregnated they become by inhaling or licking a wall or a floor with mold on it, and they'll succumb quite quickly. Um, uh, Dr. Mercola has um, a, a fermented food for cats and one for dogs. And this cat, we, we give her turkey, and sometimes we'll give her you know, some of the food we're eating, when it's gourds, uh, you know, uh, she loves it. And we'll take a little tiny half a scoop of Dr. Mercola's 
fermented food and put it in there. Uh, Cindy, Barbie, Dolores, I wish you guys could see this cat. Ruth and I are amazed that in the past five years, it has become younger and younger and younger. It has gone from a dying, wasting, diarrhea cat five years ago to a kitten. We don't get it. It's old now. Doesn't have the gray hair. Diet is everything. Price Pottinger's cats, you ever, doctor, there were two uh, dentists, Price and Pottinger, who studied cats and diets. They were right. They were right. If you love your pets, be very careful of mycotoxins. Now, um, you can, you know, spaghetti squash mixed in with her turkey or her chicken. She absolutely loves that. Uh, every day or every other day, a little scoop or half a scoop of one of Dr. Mercola's products. I love that guy. Um, I feel so sad for him. But at any rate, um, he's got some dynamic products for pets. He works with a veterinarian, he's got some dynamic products, and I hope that helps. <clears throat> so we have done that for years and years and years. Uh, uh, chloroxygen is a liquid chlorophyll, a couple drops in our water, or a dog's water. Um, the more, you know, we love, I'll never forget when Saki, this big Akita, Dr. Uh, Stuart Berger, who passed away many years ago, a Harvard psychiatrist, became a friend of mine. I helped him with a book he wrote called Dr. Berger's Immune Power Diet. He used to pick me up in the airport, John. He'd have a Rolls Royce, his Rolls Royce, come to the airport and pick me up either in Jersey or New York, when I used to go out and visit him, it was so embarrassing. People would look at me like I was some kind of celebrity. And so I did what you used to do. I hopped in the front seat, because if you get in the back seat, everybody thinks you're somebody. Um, but at any rate, uh, a Dr. Berger, in return for helping him with this, I'm in New York staying at a Sheraton or something, and he gives me this little fuzzy dog and I, we didn't have phone cameras back then, but um, I got a picture taken and sent it to Ruth and the boys. They were young then, and we were just all in love. Uh, and trying to get a dog from the Sheraton downtown Manhattan into a cab, nobody takes a dog back then, 30 some years ago. Uh, but this dog turned, and then Ruth and I got online, we began to read about uh, these Akita dogs, they're, uh, they're tough, they can tear apart a child, and, uh, and they're the worst dog to have, like Dobermans, you know, or, or something. That dog slept with the kids, was so gentle, it was amazing. And when that dog died, I had to pick it up, it was 120 pounds, I sobbed like a baby. I've been to funerals. I sobbed like a baby. We lost one of our best friends. Had I known then what I know now, Saki wouldn't have died young. I'm teaching people on this venue how to live well. And fortunately, I'm living proof of that. I don't have a doctor. I get asked that, you know, insurance, who's your doctor? I am. Oh, are you an MD? No, no, I'm not. Uh, but I take care of myself. Okay. Um, and the same is true for pets. You can either feed them, I don't know the answer, it's flower pollen extract antifungal. Just those four words. And you'll up will pop some uh, studies, there'll be scientific studies on how this uh, flower pollen extract has antimicrobial or antifungal properties. If it is, given what I believe, given what, what Dr. You know, uh, Costantini has written, prostate cancer, hope at last, it's fungus, it's all fungus. I think it will help, okay? Um, <clears throat> can you help me detox when I have been on antibiotics due to serious health problems? Uh, boy, the first thing that comes to mind is bentonite clay baths, is sweating, is near, there's two schools of thought, near or far, infrared, inexpensive little saunas that we can join a gym that has them, or now for under $1,000, we can get one of these in our home. Um, 
then take care of the internal with, I've talked about glutamine, L-glutamine, I've talked about uh, psyllium, I've talked about, you know, various uh, good probiotics. I got to tell you folks, when you're taking a living probiotic, you're establishing a little munition, a living munition factory in your body. While you sleep, it's working to restore the terrain of the bowel. There are so many, uh, and thank you for asking me, Sherry, there's so many ways to do this. But basically, you may have a mycotoxicosis, a mycotoxin-induced illness. And mycotoxins can be, we can detoxify to them. The one thing that's published about psyllium, a good psyllium product, try this one, Poop Doc, one of my advertisers, full bottle there, daily fiber, so good, Poop Doc, on my, you know, Know the Cause website. Um, is they bind, while you sleep, they're binding, they're absorbing mycotoxins uh, in your gut, and they encourage regularity. Uh, so peristalsis will be enhanced. You'll get up in the morning and go, wow, I gotta go to the bathroom, this is good. Um, detox is different things to different folks. By eating the right food, by detoxifying the interior, and detoxifying the cells in your body with you know, I used to put a half a cup of Epsom salts, uh, you know, in the bath, magnesium sulfate, it's called, in the bath and soak in that. I ran the White Rock half marathon in two hours on my 50th birthday, 22 years ago. And man, I put a whole cup of Epsom salts in there. My <laughs> muscles were all firing as an old guy, um, but it felt great. There, it's, look online. There are various approaches to detoxifying. I just gave you a, an overview of some of them. Good luck to you, Sherry. Do that. I'm glad you're watching. So raw sunflower seeds are not okay to eat. Mm. Do you have cancer? Do you have crippling arthritis? Do you have diabetes? Do you have an autoimmune disease that is uh, zapping you? then I'd stay away from sunflower seeds. I found myself on my birthday um, eating a piece of, a no, promise, no sugar, it's coconut sugar, carrot cake, ha, huh. to live for. It was so good. Now, if I had cancer, prostate cancer, I wouldn't have done that. I said, okay, you know, maybe next year, maybe my 73rd birthday, I'll have a piece of that. So you have to kind of weigh it Nothing more important that we start thinking right now. The risks versus the benefits. I'm asking all of you to think about this with our children right now. The risks versus the benefits, okay? Um, hi, Doug. I've been uh, trying to find a lab that tests you for mycotoxins. I can't get any answers. Uh, call uh, uh, Great Smokies Diagnostic Laboratory. I think they do mycotoxin testing. They've been around, John, forever since I was in this field. And then real-time laboratories here in Dallas, they do it. Uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to find. And more importantly, sometimes you upset a doctor when you... Oh, good. Okay, thanks, John. Oh, uh, urgent. A friend with diabetes, hypertension, and kidney disease, trying to avoid dialysis. Okay. A friend with diabetes, hypertension, and kidney disease, trying to avoid dialysis. Dolores, have, is there any way you can take my reprint? It's available to all of you right there on my website. Getting started, pull it down. A doctor's antifungal protocol or fungal protocol. Print a copy of that. It's two pages. You take it to the doctor. The kidneys, folks, I, I mean, it, it's just so amazing, their filtration process. There it is. Thank you, John. Right down there to the bottom, doctor's fungal protocol. And there's Frank, my buddy Frank, NSC. Uh, and take that to the doctor and say, thanks, John. That's it. Two pages, right? And take it to the doctor and uh, say, do you remember when we looked today at mycotoxins can be carcinogenic, neurotoxin, remember nephrotoxic? Kidneys. If you've got 
uh, what we call fungemia. If you've got a fungal condition in your bloodstream, the kidneys are going to filter it. Okay? And the kidneys will end up with the deposits from our bloodstream of all these mycotoxins. And then what's obviously hypertension can be induced. Obviously what your friend is going through now is so, so difficult. Uh, trying to avoid dialysis, diabetes, high blood pressure. We give animals diabetes with baflomycin and streptozotocin. Pathogenic germs. Could this person have a, a fungal problem? I would get them on the diet, ASAP, with the help of a doctor, because this is fairly serious. The doctor has to approve it and kind of follow them. Once again, how I wish they had a naturopathic doctor to guide them. I paid out of pocket, says Gloria, to, for it to be done at Vibrant Labs in California. Thank you. Vibrant, V-I-B-R-A-N-T, Labs in California. Results showed my husband has very high levels of several mycotoxin strains. Good for you. I know we have a lot of California viewers. Thank you, Gloria. Vibrant Labs in California. Um, okay. Uh, Karen, watching us on YouTube, thank you. What are the four best brand supplements for systemic fungal growth? Um, okay, uh, one would be caprylic acid. Uh, another would be resveratrol. Another would be a, a probiotic, which has lactic acid, uh, which antifungal. Uh, a probiotic, and that's more systemic uh, than just against fungus itself. And another would be all important as, a, as an antifungal and antimycotoxin is cholecalciferol, vitamin D3. Um, those would be the big four for me. Karen, thank you for watching. I hope, uh, I hope that helps. Can yeast overload be eliminated with uh, fiber products like Poop Doc? Monica, I think that's part and parcel to one of the many things they do. Uh, they trap these mycotoxins and help you get rid of the yeast and mycotoxins and fungi that make them in the gut. Um, what do you do that tells you if a home is moldy? Uh, 20 bucks. Uh, first of all, it's more expensive to bring someone in and do uh, testing. They have those little and they can take samples. Usually they go into your bathroom because tubs overflow and it's humid in the morning when you're taking a shower. Then they go into your master bedroom, then they go into the kitchen and they can take air samples, trap them, take them back to the lab and start testing with petri dishes. That's expensive. That can cost hundreds of dollars. But a petri dish in a, or I'm sorry, petri dish. A uh, yeah, petri dish that you can get at any hardware store will also tell you very much the same thing. It'll take a few days to grow it out. It may be less diagnostic because they're not going to say, oh, it's basidiomycosis or it's candida or it's fusarium. Um, they're going to tell you, you're going to have to look at that and say, wow, green fuzz. So it's non-specific, it's general, but it's inexpensive. You'll have an answer. Now, not all mold growth is pathogenic. Uh, so know that sometimes you'll show up. Now. As a matter of fact, of the 1.5 million species that we believe are out there, it's now up to 2 million of fungi, we now have categorized 75 or 85,000 of them. And of those, 300, 310 have been found to be pathogenic. So you're looking at tiny, tiny numbers. Here's the problem. And we went over this today. It's a good summary of today. We have found that those we are commonly exposed to, I mean, if these were on Mars or on Jupiter, you know, and they're pathogenic, so what? I'm not going to Mars or Jupiter. We have found they're in our food supply. We smoke them in cigarettes. We take them when we're sick, ironically, antibiotics. Uh, we drink it commonly, alcohol. And I think cumulatively, folks, you, you think about, in my old days, sitting in a bar. I remember this. There was a bar in Venice, California that my friends and I would meet at, you know, when it got dark. <laughs> what a fun place. There would be a counter with peanuts on it. 
everybody at that counter would be smoking cigarettes and drinking. Remember what I said earlier? One exposure to mycotoxins and one don't make two, makes 15. There you've got peanuts, cigarettes, booze. You just need to think it through. We need to be careful. There are consequences to lifestyle choices. That's where I want to go today. Never shake my finger at you because I've been down every road. So don't feel embarrassed asking me questions. I've been there. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. God bless you. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Tell a friend to watch this if it's helped you. Goodbye.